Yeah. 
you please stand if you're able and greet someone around you?
shall we? Father in heaven, we pause in your presence this morning, first of all, just to give you thanks for this day that you've given to us, for giving us life and health and strength that we could be here this morning. Father, we thank you as well for the freedoms that we enjoy, that we can gather together in this way. We pray, Lord, for our brothers and sisters around the world who are gathering this morning as well, but who are gathering in fear. Or gathering in secret, gathering in small groups, or even those that are gathering simply in their own households. God, would you be near them? Would you bless them? Would you encourage them to continue to remain faithful because you are a faithful God? But Father, as we have gathered together here this morning and as we enjoy this time together, Father, we pray that we have come with open and receptive hearts and minds to listen to what you have for us. We know that you're a God who has spoken in the past and a God who continues to speak. And I believe that you have a message for each one of us here this morning. So, Father, as we sit at your feet here today and as you speak to us, help us to listen intently to what you have for us. God, we we worship you, we praise you, we thank you that you are a God such as you are. We love you and we want to worship you in spirit and in truth here today. So bless us as we seek to do that. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Christian greetings to each one of you. Special welcome to our visitors this morning. Good to see you here with us this morning. If you care to, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 89 for our devotional this morning. Psalm chapter 89. This is the first Sunday in September. I think Greg talked about this a little bit uh, last Sunday in his message, but a lot of things change in this time of year. There's a lot of things that that are different or going to be different in the next week or a couple weeks. Uh, Today, for uh, several of you children, this will be your first day of official Sunday school. Uh, Never been to Sunday school before. I hope you're all excited about that. Your teachers are excited. They look forward to seeing you there. And I'm sure your parents are probably excited as well. They're not quite sure how that's going to go, but they believe that you're going to have fun. They know you'll have fun and that you'll enjoy that. But that's a, that's a change. That's a big change for a child of that age. For most of you, I think, uh, students as well, this coming week will be the start of a new school year. Uh, whether that's public school or a Christian school or maybe even college in the next few weeks. Some have gone back already and that's a, that's a big change as well. Might not be, it might be the, the first time that you've gone to school. Uh, it might be that you've been in school, but you're going to be in a different grade. You're going to have different teachers. You're going to have different subjects. A lot of changes happening there. We see changes in our weather. Uh, for uh, some time, it's been nice and warm. The last few nights, it's been cool. And uh, we'll hopefully have some more warm weather. But you can see already, I know at, at our place, some of the leaves are starting to turn just a little bit already. Signs of change in the seasons. For many of you, there have been a number of changes just in the last week or two with some of the mandates and the other regulations that have come down, maybe pertaining to your job, pertaining to your occupation, things that you've had to make a decision about or you're in the process of making a decision, some major, major changes in your lives. And these things can be very unsettling very difficult, very challenging to walk through, to deal with, to try to, yeah, to try to handle. Um, 
But as I think about our lives today and as, as I read scripture, I need to come back to the realization that hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, people just like us and their everyday lives continue to have changes as well. Their lives didn't remain totally constant all throughout their lives. They dealt with changes. They dealt with challenges. They dealt with a lot of things in their lives as well. And the psalmist here in Psalm 89, is, is I think as he's sharing with that, talking about some of the things that he's lost and some of the blessings that he's had. But the thing that does remain constant is God. You know, there's an old saying, and I don't know who said it, but the only thing that doesn't change is that things continue to change. But God does not change. He is constant. He is firm. He is steadfast. And in the midst of all the things that, that are in, uh, in an upheaval in our lives, we can hang on to that. And we can stand on that. And what a blessing that is. Psalm 89, I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 18. And just, just think about the things that the psalmist talks about in here, the things that he shares as you think about the circumstances that you find yourself in, maybe some of the changes that you're going through, some of the challenges that you have in your life right now, and maybe some of the things that you see coming on the horizon. How am I going to handle that? How am I going to do that? Think about what the psalmist talks about when he talks about who God is. Psalm 89, beginning with verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever. And build up your throne to all generations, Selah. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, and high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long. And in your righteousness they are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength, and in your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, and our King to the Holy One of Israel. Let's pray again, shall we? Father, again, as we pause here this morning, we understand and we recognize that uh, today and in the coming week or two, there's a a lot of changes for a lot of us, from the children all the way up to the oldest ones among us. And Father, in the midst of all these changes and challenges and the stress and the things that come with that, it can cause a, a turmoil to be going on within us to uh, try to navigate or to understand how best to navigate those things. But God, we recognize this morning that, that you never change, that you are faithful. You can be nothing else. In your perfectness and in your holiness, you are faithful. You always have been and you always will be. You've always been strong. You've always been mighty. You've always been in control. And you still are and you always will be. So God, as we think about the challenges that we face, help our minds, first of all, to go to you, to recognize who you are and that we serve an awesome God, a God who is faithful, a God who is strong, a God who is mighty. Help us to continue to put our faith and our trust and to rest 
in you. So, Father, we thank you for being such a God as that. Continue to bless us as we sing of your mercies together here today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This time I'll... My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest prank, but holy lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to veil his face, I press on his unchanging grace. In every heart and stormy gale, my anchor Hymn number four. Hymn number four, down at the cross. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down for the cleansing from sin I cry. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name. within there at the cross where he took me in glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood Come. Um. 
understand where I came from and where I am, I'm, I'm going to. Um, as we think of Labor Day, um, one of the questions that comes to my mind is, what are you working? What are you doing for labor? What is your occupation? What is your vocation? And we have all kinds of different occupations or vocations represented here this morning. And I think that's, you know, that's great that we have such a wide variety of vocations within our congregation. The second question then that I have is why are you working? What is it that makes you get up each morning, makes you go to your job or your where, whatever it is that you're doing, why is it that you're working? And I think it's important that we realize 
that there are different motives for working. One of the motives for working is to have an income, to be able to support ourselves, our family, and those around us who have needs. The Bible says if we don't provide for our own family that we are worse than an infidel. The other thing that I think it's important is that we realize why we are working is that God has commanded us to work. And in the Scripture, according to my commentary, there are 859 passages that are related to work. So if there's 859 passages in the Bible that are related to work, it's probably something that is quite important. But also there is a wrong motive for working. And in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 2, the writer there, Isaiah says, why are you laboring in vain to get that which does not satisfy? Solomon says the same thing. Solomon says that there's a lot of chasing after the wind, and it all is vanity. So this morning, to begin with, I simply want to look at a few verses to help us set a base for the importance of labor. And we are going to begin in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, where it says that the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. After God had created the universe, he created the garden of Eden, he has Adam and Eve, he he places them in the garden, and he gives them the charge that they are to tend and keep the garden. It was their responsibility. It was their vocation to take care of this place which God had created and given to them. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, not too many verses after this, after the fall of mankind, there we read in verse 17 of chapter 3 that God says to Adam, He said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So God says to Adam, because of what you have done, because you have disobeyed my command, he says, you're going to toil, you're going to work. You're going to sweat. At one point he says, it's by the sweat of your brow that you're going to eat of the fruit of the land. So work is something that God has commanded. And then turn with me to to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. God says here, He says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. He says, six days you're going to labor. On the seventh day, he says, you and everything in your land is going to rest. Now turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3.22. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 22. This is Solomon writing, So I perceive that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own work. 
for that is his heritage, for who can bring him to see what will happen after him? Solomon says he perceives that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own work. Do you rejoice in your work? Do you find your work, your vocation, do you find it to be satisfying? Do you find it to be fulfilling? I, I feel very bad, sorrow, sorrowful, for those people who hate to go to work. For those people who dread going to their place of employment, or if they're self-employed in what they are doing. If, if there is no amount of money that can make that kind of a job worthwhile. It would be much better to enjoy what you're doing and not getting paid than getting paid a huge amount of salary and to hate your work. Because there's no satisfaction, there's no rejoicing in that. Mark chapter 6 verse 3 is a verse that I found interesting. In Mark chapter 6, verse 3, we have these words written about Jesus Christ. What was Jesus known for? It says in verse 3, Is this not the carpenter? the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, jo Judas, Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Why were they offended? Because of what he was teaching. And they were offended because this Jesus of Nazareth was a carpenter. They knew who, who his brothers were. They knew who his sisters were. And his teaching about him being the Messiah, being the one who had come to, to fulfill the prophecies of Isaiah, they said, how can this be? He's our carpenter. So Jesus was known for the vocation of being a carpenter. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Chapter 3, verse 23. There Paul, writing to the church of Colossae, says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Once again, I ask the question, what I'm doing? Am I doing it heartily? Am I doing it with all of my heart? If I, am I putting my whole self into it? Am I doing the very best that I can? not just simply to please men, not to impress men, but because I realize that what I am doing is what God has called me to do. Am I doing this as my vocation to the Lord? Am I, am I performing as I know that God is watching and seeing that which I'm doing? And then lastly, John chapter 5 Verse 17, another interesting verse in Scripture. John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Now, generally, we think that, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. He did that in six days, and on the seventh day, He rested. What's God doing now? Jesus said, my Father is working. And He said, I am working also. 
So even God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are still at work. They're still at work in our present day and age. They are very much involved in what is taking place. It says in Colossians, it says, by the word of His power, everything is held together. So God and Jesus Christ are not sitting up there in a lazy boy with their feet up, resting and waiting for the end of the world to come. They're at work, the Scripture says. God worked, and we know that He worked. We have the story of creation in Genesis 1, where it says that God looked upon the earth, and there was an emptiness, and there was a void, there was a nothingness. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let the birds and the, and the fish be formed, and, and they were formed. And He said, let the trees and the grass grow, and, and they grew. And finally He said, let us make man in our own image. And in chapter 2, verse 17, it says that out of the dust of the ground, God formed Adam. Can you imagine God getting down and He starts to bring dirt together and He makes the head and He makes the body and then He says man needs arms. He needs fingers. He needs a thumb. And God creates out of the dust of the ground, this form that we call man. But the man is lying there, and there's no breath of life in him. And it says, God breathed in him to the breath of life. He went, and there was life. God worked. God worked. The work that God created, He called man. And we know how that after God had all the animals come before Adam and Adam named them, the Scripture says that there was no suitable companion for Him. And God says it's not good for man to be alone. So He caused a deep sleep to come on Adam. And once again, God went to work. This time, He took a rib out of Adam's side. And then He formed the woman. And Adam said, wow! This is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. God worked. God worked, and God continues to work. He continues to work in our lives. In chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 7, it speaks about the fact that yes, it was out of the dust of the ground that God formed mankind. Each one of us God has formed. God has made us. In Ephesians 2.10, if you turn to that portion of Scripture, it says that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that He has ordained. Workmanship. You see, this pulpit, this pulpit is made out of solid wood. But it didn't begin as a pulpit. It began as a tree. And somebody had to know, had to have the knowledge 
to be able to go and cut that tree down. And then it was taken to a sawmill, and it was sawed into lumber. But that wasn't what created the pulpit. That pulpit, that wood then was planed, it was sanded, and it came in boards. But there was someone who had to have knowledge, who had to have skill, who had to be able to, to take those boards and to cut them and fit them to put that pulpit there. That was someone's workmanship. Asked me to build a pulpit, it wouldn't look anything like that. Not even close. Because I don't have that workmanship. But the Scripture says that we are God's workmanship. We are God's workmanship. He created us. He made us. You can go to the book of Psalms 139, and it says there that we were knit together while we were still in our mother's wounds, and He knew every member of us. Boys and girls, God created you just as you are. He didn't make a mistake. Your nose isn't too big. Your ears aren't too long. God created you that way. You are perfect in God's sight. He created you as a male. He created you as a female. God did not make any mistakes. God is a perfect workmanship. When we begin to understand the creation of God and His workmanship in our lives, we begin to understand the importance. I want us to look at Isaiah chapter 29. And this is where I'm going to begin to get into the part of a bit of clay. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 16. Isaiah here is writing to the nation of Israel. And he's saying to the nation of Israel, he's saying to God's people, he's saying, surely you have turned things around. He says, shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? Otherwise, what Isaiah is, is saying is, is, the, is, the, is the potter and the clay on the same level? And he's saying, no. He's saying it can't be. For shall the thing made say of him who made it, he did not make me. Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. What Isaiah is saying, he's saying here that we are the clay. God is the potter. And if God is the potter, how can we as clay say, you made a mistake? I'm not what I'm supposed to be. Isaiah is saying, you've turned things upside down. You've got it all wrong. Another portion of Scripture dealing with clay, we find in the book of Romans chapter 9. And once again here, Paul is writing to the Romans. And he says in chapter 9, he's speaking about the nation of Israel. In verse 20 and 21, he says, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel of honor and another of dishonor? Paul is simply saying, he says, As, as human beings, as people, we have no right we have no, we do not have the right to question what God has made with the clay that He uses to make, to make us and what, what He does in our lives. And then in the book of Job, we, we also have there in Job chapter 10, verses 8 through 12. Job chapter 10, verses 8 through 12. We know the story of Job. 
and how that God had blessed him greatly. And then in one day's time, not only did he lose all of his cattle, all of his possessions, he lost all of his children. He lost his health. And in chapter 10 of Job, verses 8 through 12, Job says this, Your hands have made me and fashioned me an intricate unity, yet you would destroy me? Remember, I pray, that you have made me like clay, and will you turn me into dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Job's just just simply asking God, he said, after all that I've been through, it is you who have made me. It is you who have formed me. My life is in your hands, is what Job is saying. I already spoke about the verse from Psalms 139, verse 14. How the Scripture says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There is nothing that has been hidden from God as we were knit together in our mother's womb. And now I invite you to turn to the book of John. The book of John chapter 9. Begin reading at verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground, made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. A bit of clay. A bit of clay. How I wish that clay could speak to us this morning. That bit of clay that lay there on the pathway And people walked over it, never even noticed it. People stepped on it and never took a thought of it. That bit of clay that was laying there on that ground, how helpless and hopeless and useless it was. It was just a bit of clay. Do you ever feel like a bit of clay? Have you ever in your life felt like a bit of clay? That you were helpless, you were useless, there was nothing there for you, no one noticed you, they walked over you, they stepped on you, and nothing seemed to matter. Life just kept on going. A bit of clay. Until one day, Jesus and his disciples come walking along. And there was a blind man, a man who had been blind from his birth. And they observed him. And the disciples asked a question. The question they asked was Rabbi, teacher, who sinned? that this man was born blind. He, he was born blind, how did he sin? Or his parents. And Jesus says, neither. Neither of them sinned except 
This man was born blind so that God could, God's glory could be revealed. And then the Scripture says, that useless bit of clay that was laying there, that was hopeless, that was helpless, that was useless. He says, Jesus spit on it. And He picked it up. He worked it in His hands. And then He placed it on the eyes of the blind man. And he said to the blind man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the Scriptures tells us that the blind man did. The blind man did. Would you? Probably. If you had clay smeared in your eyes, you'd probably go wash it off. But he specifically went to the pool of Siloam where Jesus told him to go. And he washed it off. And it's, the Scripture says he came back seeing. What was used? Jesus used a bit of clay. Something that we would value as useless. Something that we would value as a nuisance. If you've ever been around clay and it gets wet, it sticks to your feet. It's slippery to walk on. It's not something that you desire. But Jesus used that, that bit of clay, to open a blind man's eyes. He opened the blind man's physical eyes, but more importantly, if you go on later in the chapter of 9, I'm thinking it's, let me see if I can get my eyes on it, 38. In verse 38, actually I'll read verse 37. And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, the blind man who had received his sight said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Not only was his physical sight Restored was his physical sight, was his physical sight given to him. It wasn't restored, he never had it. But his spiritual sight. He saw Jesus Christ. He believed that he was the Messiah. And it says he worshiped him. Folks, church, this morning. The Scripture says in Ephesians 2 that we were created for good works. We have all kinds of opportunities around us to do good works. God gives us the opportunities to do good works. My question is, do we understand the importance? Do we understand the necessity. Do we understand how utterly important it is that we take those opportunities and we use them? Jesus made a very important statement that I think so often we just glaze over. Jesus said, I must do the works while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. The night's coming, church. The darkness is fast approaching. We have the day to do the work. The Scripture says that today is a day of salvation. Are our eyes open to see the works, the opportunities that God places for us to share? There are thousands, there are millions of people 
all around the world. We have people in the farthest parts of the world. But we have, play, we have people on our doorsteps, in our towns, in our communities, in our county, that don't know Jesus. They don't have a clue. We have children that have never heard the story of God's love. They've never heard the stories of the Bible. Jesus said, I must do the works while it is yet day. Folks, church, are we doing the works while it's day? Are we going to wait and wake up sometime and wish that we would have done them? Because the night has come and we will no longer be able to work. You see, we have children growing up in our church. We have children growing up in our communities. And they are growing up. They are going to become adults. And if no one teaches them the stories of the Bible, if no one teaches them the truth of God's Word, who are they going to learn it from? If we as a church don't stand up, step up and take our responsibility, who's going to teach them? Statistics tell us that the older a person gets, the less chance there is of them receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. We need to get them when they're children. That's why we have Sunday school class for the children of our church. And you have an opportunity today as the first day of a new Sunday school year, and I thank everyone who has taken the commitment to be a teacher in their Sunday school classes, and especially in the, in the junior department. You have an awesome privilege. You have an awesome privilege to teach children the truth of who God is. That He is not someone there who is, who is looking to judge them and condemn them, but He is one who is looking to show them love and acceptance, and that He has a plan for their lives. That's an awesome privilege. We have Vacation Bible School, where we have children from this church and children from the community that come and get taught stories from God's Word through the sights. And I thank God for Vacation Bible School and for those who have participated in that. We have the Awana program. It breaks my heart when I hear that there's still positions that need to be filled so that the Awana program can take place. A program where once again, children from the community and the congregation can come and they get to memorize God's Word. It's, it's, a, it's a tool that's used in such a way that the children look forward to coming. They enjoy coming to one. It's not something that they feel forced to come to. They want to come. What's wrong, church? What's wrong that we can't get people to be there for them? The night's coming. The night is coming when no man can work, even if we want to. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. There's a time coming 
when judgment is going to come. There's a time coming when God is going to say to Jesus Christ, His Son, go get your church. There's going to be a judgment. There's going to be a division between those who are, who are standing on the right side of, of Him and those who are standing on the left. Those who are standing on the left are those who have never come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They've never accepted Him as their Lord and Savior. Why? Maybe they've heard and they decided it wasn't for them. But maybe they've never heard. Maybe no one has ever showed them what the love of God looks like. It doesn't matter. It says in verse 41, the Son of Man will send out His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The night's coming. The time is coming when we won't have opportunity anymore to share the love of God. What was the result of that one bit of clay that was used by the master? The result was that a man's eyes were opened, his physical eyes, his spiritual eyes, and he was able to proclaim, Lord, I believe. He's not going to be one of those in Matthew chapter 13 that are going to be cast into a place of torments, of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. He's going to be one who hears the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. Can you imagine the exhilaration if that one bit of clay could speak to us this morning on how it felt to be used by the Master to bring eyesight to the blind, both physical and spiritual. Brothers and sisters, we are that bit of clay. We are that bit of clay. We have been formed out of the dust of the earth. We are products of Adam and Eve. We have the opportunity to be that bit of clay that Jesus can use to anoint the eyes of the blind around us if we're willing. If we're willing. If I'm willing. Am I willing to be that bit of clay to be used for His honor and His glory? Shall we pray? Father God, today we thank You. We thank You that You are the potter and that we are the clay. We thank You that we are Your workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works that You have created beforehand for us to walk in them for us to do them. Father, we thank You this morning for the story that's recorded in John chapter 9. We thank You for the story of the blind man and how that You used that bit of clay to anoint his eyes so that when he went and washed, he came back seen. And when he understood who it was that had touched him, he was able to exclaim, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Father, today, may we realize that the time is short 
that Jesus himself realized that he must work while it is day, for the time is coming when no man can work. So, Father, open our eyes to see the opportunities to work for you, to work for your kingdom, to share the love of Jesus Christ with a lost and a dying world who are going to go to a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth unless they are told, unless they are shown the love of Jesus Christ, the love of the Father. Father, this morning, may you take your words, put them to practice in our lives, impress them upon our hearts for your honor, for your glory, and for the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.